Uh, welcome to the Education Symposium. Uh, we are going to be previewing the second edition of the Exploring Animal Behavior in Laboratory and Field book that is currently in production. In keeping with the true spirit of the first edition, we have solicited submissions from ADS members. We've expanded the scope of coverage and reorganized the way in which activities are presented. The volume is divided into four main sections describing behavior, theory of behavior, application of behavior, and communicating science. The aim of this symposium is to demonstrate and discuss six chapters representing multiple sections of the book. Not only will this provide us with an opportunity to collect feedback on the chapters, but it will also offer a preview of what the volume offers. Chapters provide variations that permit use in labs, in standard class periods, and online learning. Each of our three sessions pairs two chapter authors to discuss their chapters, and we've selected chapters that do not involve the use of animals in order to facilitate authors trying out each other's labs. Today we're highlighting two chapters from the theory of behavior section. Examining variability in the song of the white crowned sparrow by Doug Wacker, and The Evolution of Behavior, A Phylogenetic Approach by Jordan Price and Ken Yasukawa, with Jordan presenting. Uh, we'll, we'll be starting with Jordan, so let me first introduce him to you. Jordan Price is a professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland, a small public liberal arts college near the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay. His research combines methods from behavioral ecology and molecular phylogenetics to investigate the evolution of animal traits, especially the behaviors, sounds, and color patterns of birds. He received his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his Bachelor's of Science with honors from Queen's University in Canada. The chapter, The Evolution of Behavior, a Phylogenetic Approach, is a revised version of an activity by the same title, which was written by Jordan's co-author, Ken Yasukawa, and which appeared in the first edition of the book, Exploring Animal Behavior in Laboratory and Field. Ken's original activity was hard to improve upon, so although the examples and data differ from the original, many of the most important aspects of that exercise remain intact. And with that, I will turn it over to Jordan. Thanks, Sue. Um, so, just to give a little introduction to, um, to the chapter, I think that using phylogenetic trees has become increasingly common in biology, um, including in studies of, of animal behavior. Um, but I think that many biologists do not really have a, a great understanding of how phylogenies are constructed and how they are interpreted. Um, many of you will recall that from your animal behavior textbooks that the evolution of behavior was one of Nico Tinbergen's four levels of analysis, um, the others being survival value, developments, and proximate mechanisms underlying these traits. Um, to Tinberg and another early ethologist, phylogenetic relationships among species really provided a, a framework upon which our understanding of the other aspects of behavior could be derived. Um, yet, the evolution of behavior is probably the least studied aspect of animal behavior. So the central learning objectives of this exercise are for students to understand how phylogenetic trees are constructed and interpreted, um, to gain experience scoring behavioral characters into character states, which can then be mapped onto a phylogenetic tree, and to learn how to infer the evolutionary sequence of events. In other words, the, the order of past changes that led to the behavioral characteristics we see in a group of species today. Um, so in most laboratory exercises uh, looking at phylogenies, students are given a set of character, characters and then asked to use these characters to construct a phylogenetic tree. Uh, perhaps you've even done this in a class. In our exercise, in contrast, students are asked to do the opposite. Um, they're given a phylogeny and asked to use it to reconstruct the evolution of a set of behavioral characters. Um, and this actually aligns really well with how phylogenies are generally used in studies of animal behavior. Um, very few studies actually use behavioral characters to determine species relationships. Um, rather, given the widespread availability of molecular data and sophisticated tree building techniques, a lot of things that, that um, 
are kind of out of our areas of expertise. Phylogenetic relationships among species are often just assumed to be correct um, based on a molecular tree. And these relationships are then used to address hypotheses about behavioral evolution. So that's what we do in this exercise. So the, the activity is, in, is divided into, into two parts. Um, first, students run through a whole class exercise in which they score some behavioral characters and then map these traits onto a phylogeny for six New World blackbird species, um, the group including the New World or the uh, red winged blackbird, and to see how these traits evolved. Um, in doing this, they learn a bit about the evolutionary history of female song and duetting and social breeding system and, and migratory behavior in this group. So actually a secondary goal of this exercise is to show students that some behaviors have evolved in directions that are really the opposite of what we often assume. You know, female song, for example, has been lost in many bird species rather than gained in other species. In the second part of the exercise, students choose their own species of interest and a phylogenetic tree, and they then work in small groups to reconstruct how a set of selected um, behaviors evolved. So the benefit of this activity is that it can really be done entirely online. This is similar to, to Doug Wacker's activity that you're gonna hear about. Um, both use free software. In my case, they use a program called Mesquite, um, which is relatively easy to use once students are given some initial instructions. So with that, um, I don't know if Doug has some questions for me. Yeah, so so first I should say that I just I, I went through uh, Dr. Price's activity and uh, did both uh, the work by hand and in Mesquite and it was very straightforward and, and excellent. I, I plan to use it in my own class next year. So uh, kudos up front. I, I thought it was really, really a great job. Um, I think it is fantastic that it emphasizes the comparative method and uh, also uh, help students understand the evolution question by Tim Bergen. In my classes, that is the question type that students do not get uh, up front and, and need some work with. So this is a great activity to help them understand that. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, so uh, Jordan and I went through each of our activities and uh, we, we took lots of, lots of notes, had lots of comments, um, and then we kind of narrowed them down a little bit. Um, I think probably have, we're, we're very similar people. We're really, you know, very careful and deliberate about what we're doing, but, but it was it was excellent. So I've kind of narrowed it down to these kind of more general questions that I had, not being an evolutionary biologist. And I think this has actually been helpful because you know in animal behavior we have lots of different types of scientists working in this one field. So I am not trained as an evolutionary biologist. So some of my questions might seem simplistic to those that are. So I apologize for that. Um, so one thing that I saw uh, in, in your introductory part of your, of your activity was you uh, emphasized that, that evolutionary biologists use molecular data to construct phylogenetic trees. Uh, and the main reason is that it's just, there's a multitude of characters then that can then be examined. But I, I know there are other reasons why using kind of molecular data versus morphological or physiological data uh, it, it can be advantageous. And I was wondering if, if you might speak to those and then whether you think those might be worth including in, in your explanation to students. Great. No, that's a great question, um, which I'm glad you asked. It, 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 I, this is something I often find, actually, that um, I have a hard time um, explaining to students um, why molecular data is so useful um, and why it's used so much now for figuring out relationships. I mean, it used to be the case that we would use uh, anatomy and physiology and, and, and behavior um, to construct uh, phylogenetic or to reconstruct phylogenetic relationships. Um, I mean, the thing about molecular data is really that it's just, there's just so much of it. You know, if you have even a gene just has thousands of characters and nowadays using entire genomes, I mean, we can potentially have billions of characters um, that are used to figure out relationships among things. And it is not necessarily the case that molecular characters are um, 
you know, show less convergence and less uh, and are, are less variable, uh, like or or have uh, each molecular character doesn't necessarily have um, less of a chance to mislead us than say a morphological character does. In fact, there's lots and lots of convergent evolution that happens at the molecular level. Um, you know, if an A changes to a to a, you know another another nucleotide, if the adenine changes to a thymine, it's it's possible that it's going to change back again um, in the next the, the next mutation and it's it's uh, going to overwrite previous things um, again it's just a matter of it's just, it's a matter of quantity in fact there are behavioral characters um, at least in some work that I've done that like with song evolution that actually reflect relationships better <laughs> than mitochondrial genes do um, which is kind of interesting but um, you know, molecular uh, data is often also selectively neutral. Um, we often focus on introns and, you know, third codon positions and things like that that, that vary and don't necessarily change um, the phenotype. And so these are things that, that aren't really subject to, to convergence due to selection, at least. Um, which is certainly not the case with phenotypic characters. So there's, so there is that benefit that you can look at things that are neutral. Great. Thank, thank you for that explanation. That's great. I very much appreciate that. Um, let's see. Uh, I may jump around a little bit on my my list here. Um, oh, there's a you mentioned in the instructor notes um, that uh, some students have difficulty with tree thinking. Mm. And uh, I wondered if uh, for the non-evolutionary biologist instructors out there, whether you might include or maybe you know of some could speak to some resources that, that might help students. I mean, I think this is a, a great example of getting them to think about that. But are there some papers out there, there's some resources specifically maybe for instructors that might help us get students on that, that right page with regards to tree thinking? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you sent me that that suggestion earlier, and I, I, I've already been incorporating it <laughs> into the oh. new version. I think I think it's great advice. Um, there certainly are some some great papers about um, just you know how to how to interpret phylogenies and and you know as we call it tree thinking. Um, and you gave me some good advice actually for I think a recent a couple of recent papers. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll definitely incorporate that into the instructor notes because I think it would be really helpful for folks to to be able to go outside and read about um, how this stuff is done and get a bit more information than than they can get just from from this chapter. Well, I'm glad I'm glad my suggestions were helpful. I wasn't sure they were going to be. I just kind of pulled a few out that I thought might work. But, uh, you know, I, I, one thing that I found in the past when I, when I taught physiology, and it may be relevant, may not be, is uh, I remember uh, when I was trying to get students to understand uh, the first equation, I had them actually read an education paper on how to teach that material. And the students reading that paper, I think, understood it better because they had to understand the way to teach it. So I, I don't know if that's an approach that one could use is to use a paper about how to teach tree thinking. I have students read that so they better understand it. But I, I don't know, it probably depends on the paper, so. Yeah, that's great advice, absolutely. All right, so, um, oh yeah, and then this, this other question. And again, this, this uh, relates to my, my uh, not being an evolutionary biologist, so, so I'm, I'm very curious what you have to say about this. So we, we kind of drill this idea of parsimony into our students' heads, um, and, at one point in the activity, you remind us that, that this rule is somewhat arbitrary. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to, you know, do, do we really, do we use this principle only because it's kind of the, the easiest principle? Or is there something really to this uh, biologically that the, the simplest explanation for kind of reconstructing these trees is often the most correct? Uh, yeah, I've thought about this a lot, actually. Um, I think <laughs> I think it's a question that actually is is even broader than biology. I think that it's more of a philosophical um, tenet that that the simplest explanation, you know, is often the correct one. Um, you know, regardless of of how things look, but, you know, the butler probably did commit the murder in the Agatha Christie novel, um, and. 
yeah, I think in in reconstructing trees, they're just or reconstructing evolutionary history. There are so many possibilities and looking at the one with parsimony refers to looking at the one with or, or accepting the one with the fewest evolutionary changes, the simplest explanation. Um, and I think, you know, all else uh, held constant. I think that is a, a pretty good um, uh, a good rule to follow, just in general, actually. Um, but it, I mean, there's certainly lots of exceptions. It, there, you know, if if say evolutionary losses are are way more likely than evolutionary gains, or if you know there are other factors that we need to take into account, um, you know, some of, the, some of which I cover in the chapter a bit, um, then, you know, the most parsimonious explanation actually maybe isn't the best explanation. And maybe we should, we should um, rethink things. That's a good question. Yeah, I wonder, yeah, I, I, so I, I apologize, I didn't, uh, didn't prep this one, but it's just to, it, to extend that a little bit, got me thinking about it. Um, are there, are there good examples out there of where, uh, phylogenies were reconstructed using morphological data based on parsimony. And then suddenly when we had the molecular data set, things became radically different. And uh, so adding, you know, those characters really changed our understanding. Yeah, I think um, that's a, it's a big frustration for biologists in general. I think that, that our understanding of, of relationships keeps changing. I, hopefully they're gonna change less and less, you know, as, as we kind of run out of characters to use. But um, yeah, I mean, pandas, you know, giant pandas and red pandas used to be, <laughs> they, they share so many similarities and they used to be um you know lump there in the same group and and they're clearly you know we know from molecular data convergent you know they even have some convergence at the molecular level actually with genes that are involved in like producing those extra thumbs that they have yeah i i remember that example in your activity and i even mentioned that it might be worthwhile depending on uh on what you what you think is best to even include a, a figure about that because it's such kind of an important principle and then you can even mm of role this idea of, of using molecular characters to, to reconstruct phylogenies into that. So I, I thought that was a great section where, just in general, where you built in principles into the activity, I thought that was great because you do that throughout. So um, I wanted to, to, this is more of a comment, but I want to see what you think about this. So um, in the uh, activity two, where students are, of creating are going out and finding a phylogeny and then finding kind of behaviors that they can superimpose on that phylogeny i've done a little bit of that informally in my classes and i wonder if you if you think students if you think that's going to take a long time to not find the right type of phylogeny that's easy straightforward find the behaviors and, and or if maybe would it be worthwhile to suggest a few at least in the instructor resources maybe to, to to help those students out yeah that's a good idea do you think i should have or we should have in the instructor notes maybe recommend that that instructors you know come up or come up with a series of phylogenies in advance um, to save time i think that's probably a pretty good a pretty good idea yeah, i think it would help I think so. me yeah yeah, yeah i think so because students can get lost in the weeds when they yeah, start totally. to try to look for a phylogeny and just to follow up on that a little bit um it it was not straightforward to find a really clear phylogeny on tree of life and i'm mm -hmm. wondering if if you have seen the website timetree.org um Time you may want to take a look because you can type in a taxa at whatever level you want and it will spit back a phylogenetic tree is this um, birdtree.org is time that? tree, time, time tree. tree. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cause I, for me, that was much easier. So I will often use that in my class when I want to generate, you know, an example of a, of a phylo phylogenetic tree at, a, awesome. at a very basic level. I will incorporate that. Um, I think unless you have anything further, Doug, I think we should probably wow. now. That um, is right where I'm. Move I'm, on. Finish, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So now we'll let Heather um, take it from here. 
Great. So our uh, second author is Doug Wacker. He received his bachelor's in biological sciences from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and his PhD in neurobiology and behavior from the University of Washington. He's currently an, ass an assistant professor of animal behavior at the University of Washington Bothell. Okay, a small primarily undergraduate campus in the larger UW system. Dr. Wacker studies social behavior and communication of wild birds, including uh, seasonal territoriality in song sparrows and vocal communication and roosting behavior in American crows. Thank you. I just saw, it's funny, I'm looking at my video and I just saw a bird like zoom past me, which was either a junker or a song sparrow, but it's hard to identify from behind. But um, yeah, so I, so thanks for, for including me in this. I think it's great. And uh, my, my chapters on examining uh, very variation in um, the song of the white crowned sparrow. And I think students are really used to comparing behaviors between different animal groups. Uh, but when students do that, they, they really concentrate on mean differences. And obviously the variation um, in behavior uh, at many different levels is, is really important. And I think to some degree underappreciated by, by undergraduates. Um, so what I was hoping to do with this activity was, was to find a way to kind of allow students to explore variation in behavior in, in a number of, of different ways. Um, and, and I think birdsong in general is a really good model to, to look at that. So uh, we can think of variation in behavior b between species. Um, I was thinking about the song sparrow and song sparrows. I, I haven't looked at this, you know, quantitatively, but, but my feeling is that song sparrows have a more variable song uh, than white crowns. And, and this makes sense because uh, song sparrows sing multiple song types, where white crown sparrows only sing a single song type. Uh, so, so that's kind of an interesting uh, un comparative kind of understanding for students to get, that, that there are these you know, fundamental differences between species. Even uh, within the white crowned sparrow species, there's a variation in the song that they sing. Uh, and, and this is based on work that Peter Marler did that I think most folks here are going to be pretty familiar with, where white crowned sparrows sing uh, regional dialects. Uh, and so a song, or a, a white crowned sparrow that you hear in this part of the, the world is, uh, or in this population even, and may sound different than, than, than a sparrow that you hear singing in this population. And that's really interesting because it gets students thinking about well, why is that? Oh, wait, you know, birds, songbirds learn their song. And suddenly we have this model of vocal learning. So there's this other kind of concept that, that comes out of this understanding of, of, of variation within a species there. And then, and then finally, even, um, you know, within individuals, there's some level of, of variation behavior. And it's, it's really important to understand this, how much of this variation uh, maybe in iterations of a song of, of a white crown, a single white crown sparrow, how much of that is real? How much of it is due to some kind of artifact of, of the analysis that's done, right? And you can start to think about things like inter-observer variation. How, how do you define things? How do you measure things properly, right? Is, how much variation is involved in that? Um, so the, 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 Project actually, the activity was born out of a, another activity that I do with uh, with American crows, looking at variation in their vocalizations. But as I put this together, uh, I felt like the white crowned sparrow was perhaps a, it was a great activity for me because I felt like the white crowned sparrow is better at kind of emphasizing these particular concepts. So so I am shifting to to that species to do this in my own classroom now. Um, the central I, well, before I get to learning goals, the, the main kind of the crux of this activity is that students are going to use a, a freely available program online called Raven Light, and they're going to uh, examine variability in White Crown Sparrow song, uh, in songs downloaded from a website called Zeno Canto. These are uh, freely available recordings that folks have made of all types of birds. Um, and they can then analyze these in this free program. So this is, again, uh, just like Jordan said about, about his uh, project, something that students can do remotely, completely remotely. Um, but it could be converted to, to kind of uh, some in-person things as well, and we can talk about that later. Uh, 
central learning goals and objectives of, of this exercise uh, are for students to understand how to identify and quantify characteristics of animal vocalizations uh, using spectrograms. To understand how to quantify individual and uh, inter-individual variation in animal behavior. To be able to recognize and potentially mitigate inter-observer variation in behavioral analyses and to gain experience uh, considering proximate and ultimate questions about behavioral variation using this information from the activity to then address some, some questions uh, both at the mechanistic and, and evolutionary level. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to address any questions or comments that Sure, great. I, I really like this activity. Um, I'm, I'm going to use it this fall in my class. Um, <laughs> and I'll give you credit for that. Um, so I think that, I mean, one, one of the things that I think is really cool about it is that it gets at inter-individual variation and even within individual variation in behavior. And I think a lot of students don't really appreciate that. I think, um, you know, you point out that birds have dialects and that, um, and and you know students will learn that's that some songbirds have have repertoires of song types and stuff and then you know different individuals can produce different songs um but what's cool is that you actually get into you know perhaps variability and renditions of the same song type within the same individual and and it's and and also look at um you know the reliability of measurements and stuff like that so this this activity provides some really excellent hands-on ways to get students interested in, in a really fascinating topic. Um, so I think the, the background of the, of the exercise is, is really great and succinct and just, you know, there's uh, not, not a spare sentence there. It's, it's, it covers the topic incredibly well um, and is very clear. I think just one comment that I that came to me as I was reading it is that you know you there and then later on you know talk about song phrases and elements and syllables um, and I think notes as well and at some point and and um, I think you know perhaps these components of song might be familiar to some students but but certainly not to all um, so it might be. You know, I was thinking it might be useful to have some a bit of guidance, maybe maybe even an example um, spectrogram. You know, showing um, some examples of of these things and kind of you know what the different difference between a syllable and a phrase is and stuff. Um, and I understand that you know students. One of the uh, parts of the exercise is having students think about what a phrase is and defining it. Um, and then talking with each other about, you know, what, um, how to define a phrase. So, so that's, you know, there's some, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to define and, and students are kind of asked to do that. But, but still, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on, on what might work best for students to, to give students a little bit of background while still allowing them to explore the topic themselves. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that comment. And uh, I, I, you know, it's funny, I, that was the struggle that I had is you, you, the whole purpose is for them to recognize uh, variation. And if you kind of define what the phrase is, then certainly they're just going to look at that and highlight that section, you know, on the spectrogram. Uh, and I got to thinking about it a little bit. And, and I, and I thought I'd run this past you and see what you think about this. Um, I initially, I contacted John Wingfield and got this beautiful recording of a white crown sparrow singing in Bodega Bay. And then it occurred to me afterwards that maybe I don't want to put a white crown sparrow as the example. Maybe I put a song sparrow song as the example. And then, you know, I can show what me, and, and certainly as you know, there's, there's uh, some variation in what people call a syllable versus a note and things. And, and it, sometimes it varies by species even. And, and if you look in the paper, certainly in the crow literature, things are, the wording is a little bit different, the nomenclature is mm -hmm. different. Um, but I wonder if I put maybe another Emberizid Sparrow, like another song sparrow, uh, or a song sparrow song up there, and then showed the phrases there, whether it would still kind of hide what a phrase might be defined like in a, in a, in a white crowned sparrow. 
um, and allow them to kind of discover that, that variation, but also give them some guidance. Does that sound cool or? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a really, it's a balance you need to strike. And I think that's a good idea for sure. And I like the idea of having the, the spectrogram with the kind of the definitions, the black and white spectrogram with the definitions on there. I just uh, don't want to let the cat out of the bag too early. <laughs> So, so following up on that, I mean, somewhat related, I guess, is um, like later in the exercise, I mean, students look at four song renditions from an individual and they compare their measurements of those. And then they compare phrases, uh, measurements of phrases between individual birds. And they compare like phrase one of, the, of bird A to phrase one of bird B and, and so on. And um, you know, and some, you know, these songs are really different and one might have, you know, five syllables and one has seven syllables. And I wonder if, um, if perhaps, you know, there's a way to allow students to, to think about that a little bit more than just like comparing the first syllable to the first syllable in the second or first phrase to the first phrase. Yeah, see, I'm mixing up the, the yeah. terminology, um, the, the second phrase to the second phrase and so on. Um, you know, because, it, you know, it could be that maybe, you know, bird B skips phrase two and its song actually goes, you know, like phrase, it, it, I guess what I'm talking about is homology between individuals. If phrase one is something that occurs in a lot of these birds, but phrase two is something that occurs in some, but not others, you know, um, if you were just doing it and comparing phrase two to, to the second phrase of another species, which is, or another individual, which is actually, actually phrase three, um, you would expect it to be really different. And I'm just wondering if, and maybe that's, that's adding a little bit too much sophistication to the exercise or making it too complex, but I, I wanted to hear what you thought of that, of, about this. No, I think it's, I think it's a really good point. And, and it's, it's interesting. I, I was again, balancing kind of making an exercise with examples that kind of work, right. Versus, you know, you could always randomly pick these examples and they don't, they don't really show the principles that you're trying to show as well. Um, but I definitely think it's possible to bring it up. And, and I, I, it's just, I, I like how you did it in your activity. You kind of tease at something in the questions and then give a little bit more elaboration in the instructor resources. And I, I think maybe that's the direction I'm going to go is, you know, by the time they do the act, they, the questions are after the activity is currently organized. So they could do the activity without kind of knowing that and they'll get the numbers that kind of show the principle. And then in the question, I can maybe add a little bit to the questions to say, you know, not only why is this occurring, but maybe give them some hints about why it's occurring, like what, what, what you're mentioning, and then put uh, some more specific information in the instructor resources. I, I do that a little bit with them dropping syllables, but the idea of comparing syllable one to, oh, maybe it should be compared to syllable two, you know, in this particular example. Um, I think that could be really helpful and, and really hammer home the principle more than take anything away, as long as they kind of go through the process and then get to the question. So I, I think that's probably the way I'm going to do it is kind of hint at it in the questions a little bit more and then give the instructors a little a little bit more information at the end so so they can answer student questions and kind of lead them in the right direction so i so i think that's a really valuable comment cool so but my other issue or my other other thoughts that came up for me were um were mostly pretty minor and i've shared these with yep. you already i think um that's for example you know you talk about using um Microsoft Excel and and Word, um, you know, in the exercise. And I think, you know, there, at least I have lots of students now who who just use, you know, Google Sheets and Google Docs and stuff. And right. and and who knows what they're going to be using in like five years. And and assuming, you know, this book is super popular and people are using it for for decades to come. Um, you know, there, it might be good to have some flexibility there and just kind of say to use a spreadsheet program and to use, you know, some kind of document. Um, no, that's a, it's a really good point. And actually this whole exercise has been nice in that way because it's kind of a, you know, a, 
hand to the forehead there is to say, obviously I can just put the, the actual equations to calculate these things rather than to describe how to do it. I, I think it, it, that was born out of my students having, sometimes having so much difficulty, you know, using things like Microsoft Excel efficiently. It's like they, they take sometimes a very long time to do something it can be done very quickly just because they don't know. It's, it's, you know, it's just they haven't done it before. But, but I think you're right. I think simply having kind of the, the mathematics behind some of this there and then letting them use whatever spreadsheet or, or, or word program, uh, word processing program that they, they have available to them makes a lot of sense, especially as we're, we're going remote, you know, in a, in a lot of our classes and being able to use things like Google Docs and Google Sheets and stuff is, is going to be really important. So I, I'm definitely, I think that's a really valuable uh, comment and I'm going to definitely change that part. Yeah, and, and I, I, I would just add, I, I love both of these activities because they would work so well in an online format as long as students have computers. You know, there are some students who maybe are really just using their cell phones or, um, you know, they're, they're sharing a computer with other family members. So that's the one thing I'm struggling with is how can I make this really applicable for a student who maybe doesn't have a computer? I suppose they could partner with someone and work remotely. But that's that's the one thing I'm struggling with is how to, in terms of how to use it in an online format. Yeah, I, I, I think with with our university, we've been we've been lucky um, based on the number of students that that we have been able to provide computers and provide uh, Internet resources for students that that maybe don't have those. But that's certainly not the case at every university. So I, so I think that's depending on how long the the pandemic you know, goes on that that's going to be a real struggle and yeah I, I don't have a good answer yeah. but you know I, I mean a number of these programs don't have interfaces that work well on uh, on a phone I mean even simple class interfaces don't work well so yeah. 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 can I ask one quick question about Zeno Canto sure um, of course I know both Heather and I struggled a little bit at first finding uh, the, you know, the audio clip that you, that you recommended, would you advise maybe having a professor download a whole bunch of, of, of the audio files in advance so you can just provide them to students and say, here's, you know, here's 30 files from five different birds rather than have them take the time to search for what they need? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this a lot because all three of you had, you know, a, a, maybe not difficulties, but it took a while to kind of get yeah. that figured out. And that, that's it's unfortunate you can't search by catalog number. I'm torn, actually. I mean, I, I think in, in some ways it's good for students to get experience being able to pull data off sites like this and for them to get used to searching. Um, so... I, I hadn't thought about having them download them previous, uh, you know, before having the instructors do that. And I may put that in instructor resources, maybe saying like, depending on time, maybe this would be a good approach. Um, but one thing that I might do is just emphasize very shortly, maybe even just a sentence in the student section, why they're doing that. Because, the, you know, there are a lot of data sets out there that aren't easily, and, and resources out there that aren't easy to access, but they need to learn kind of the tricks to, to, to do that. So, you know, Jordan had mentioned that maybe they should search under subspecies as well. And I think that's a really good idea, only that some of the other examples are not the same subspecies. They're, they're Orientha instead of Amboli. So, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try to find a way to rework that, but it, it, that's always balanced, right? Is, is getting the students to be, feel comfortable doing things like that, but at the same time, not just making it so difficult that they're spending all the time trying to search for something rather than do the act. So. Do you have anything else, Jordan? No, nothing. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think I think nothing worth worth extending our time. <laughs> okay. Well, I think then we can wrap up. Um, I want to um, uh, first thank both uh, Jordan and Doug for taking the time to contribute to the to the volume and also to participate in this discussion, which I, I think was really, um, really fascinating. Uh, we hope that everyone will join us for all of the chapter presentations that comprise this workshop symposium. Uh, and we hope that many of you will choose to use exercises from the new lab manual when it is available next year. So thank you again, uh, Jordan and Doug, for your time.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed being part of this. Thank you. Thank you.